Amen. Amen. Well, good after. It's not quite good afternoon, is it? Good morning, everyone. Um, the prophet Jeremiah from the Old Testament, not really the kind of guy that you would want to go bowling with. <laughs> Probably not the kind of man that you'd want to go to a comedy night. Uh, there wouldn't be a lot of laughter on his side. Very, very serious prophet of God. And he was used by God to bring some heavy challenges to the people of Israel. You see, the people of God had wandered a long way from the vision that he had for them, that God had for them. They wandered a long way. And God used Jeremiah to powerfully arrest the direction of travel of God's people. And let me read to you one verse from the book of Jeremiah that is relevant to this talk today and is this, if you like, the foundation I want us to build on as we spend some time in God's word. This is what he says, and these are challenging words, and they're words about thirst. He says this, For my people... He says, my people, he owns them. It's not, he's not pointing to him. My people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. And they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Wow. Here in a dry land in the Middle East, A thirsty people. How many times would the people of Israel be thirsty, physically thirsty, trapped in in the wilderness, wondering where the next drink was going to come from? Well, in this case, it's, it's a spiritual metaphor for the state of the heart of Israel that God, who loves his children, says, Oh, my people, my people have done two things. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and instead they've dug these cisterns. Now, this is not a cistern, a ceramic thing that you have over you know, your toilet to flush it. This is a place where rainwater would be caught in order to, uh, hopefully after the rains have gone, there's something still in it to be able to drink from, to feed animals, which are your food, and just to keep your family alive then, then they would dig these cisterns. I've seen some of these in Jordan. You can see the remains of these cisterns, and, and they are cracked. They're made of mud. And sooner or later, those cisterns will, either the water will evaporate or it just drains into the soil underneath. And God is there with the people of Israel, if you like, in a spiritual desert, saying, hello, hello, I'm, I'm just here. You know that thirst you have? I'm just here, Hello. And instead, he says, the people of Israel have turned our backs on the Lord. And instead, we're digging in the dirt. In fact, we're, we're sucking the sand to try and get water from it. What an indictment that is. What a tragedy it is. And God's heart is not one of judgment, but of invitation. Hello, hello, return. I'm over here. Could it be that not a lot has changed over all these years? Could it be that even we as a church, even you as an individual, even me, could it be we could have the same challenge from Jeremiah as goes back all the way thousands of years ago? Could it be the Lord saying, my my people, my people, they've done two things that are tragic and are evil, actually. They've abandoned me as the fountain of living water, and instead they're, they're sucking water from the sand because they want to dig their own cisterns. And that stagnant water, you know, after a while, it'll kill you. Do you know, it's interesting about this sense of spiritual thirst because I'm thirsty. I don't know about you. In fact, the title for today's talk might be uh, Let's Obey Our Thirst. We have a thirst uh, for something that is pure and good and life-giving. We all have it. And if you're here, if, you're, if we're watching at home and, and you might think, well, I'm just, I don't even know about this Christianity thing. Or if you're in the room, I don't really know. How. Listen, I would dare to suggest today that there are five things that you are thirsty for. 
And this probably applies to everyone in every culture over thousands of years since Adam and Eve first walked the earth. And that is these things. Firstly, the first thirst is to know God. Actually, we all have eternity, as Ecclesiastes says, is in our hearts. We have a, a longing, actually, to know God. We, we thirst to know God. The second thing we really need is we, we, we thirst to be known. Do you know what I mean? To actually, for someone to know us as we really are, to be understood to be listened to. Some people, somebody's thinking, that would be nice if someone actually listened to what I have to say. If somebody actually heard my heart, it, that we have a longing to be known, truly, truly known as we really are. The third one is very closely related, you see, is that the third thirst is to be loved even though we're known. Because we long to be loved as we really are. Not the person we present ourselves to be, not what our mates at school think is that we are, or our mates at work, or the people online, the, the pre, not the presented version of ourselves, not, the, not even the carefully well-behaved version of ourselves, but we actually long to be loved with the badly behaved version of ourselves. Can I hear an Amen. We, we long for that. We thirst for it. It's an intrinsic desire that we have within us. Then not only that, there's two more, I reckon. We actually long and thirst to have a purpose, to have something every day, given that we know God and that we're known and that we're loved. Then what? Then what? Well, then we, we long to have a purpose, to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning, to have some work to do. You know, work is not evil. It's a gift from God to have something to do with all the talents and gifts that God has given us. You see, we, 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 we all need to have a sense of purpose. And the fifth one of these thirsts that I've recognized, and I'm not, I'm not some expert, I'm just sharing from my heart. The fifth thing is we actually long to belong. We have a deep thirst to belong, to be part of, somebody, to be part of everybody, to be part of other people. We have this longing to belong. And the reason we know that's the case is because if you want to punish somebody who's been really, really bad, you, what do you do? You put them in a room on their own. And uh, solitary confinement, if anyone's been in that situation uh, you'll know that there is trauma from solitary confinement. My father uh, was a pilot in Vietnam. And uh, in fact, my uh, middle name, or in fact, my, there's different people. My, my first name, Timothy, is actually named after a, a prisoner of war uh, who was in Vietnam, a friend of my dad's best friend at the time. And uh, he was in solitary confinement. And he would tell you that the consequence of even a matter of days or weeks or months in solitary confinement can, can kill parts of your brain, can damage you, trauma, post-traumatic stress, all that kind of thing. The, the, that's because we're on our own. See, we have an intrinsic thirst and desire to belong and to be home and to have a home, for our heart to have a home. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, as, a, as a family together, as a church family together, look at the diversity just in this room, let alone those online, let alone those who couldn't be here today, to, to actually feel like we're part of, of a people and that we're not on our own. And COVID has been horrendous for forcing us into our individual spaces. We know that's not how we were created. Can I hear an amen? amen. And sometimes there's, there's now a hesitancy and there's a pain and there's disappointment all in the mix here. And so the thinking of water, thinking of wells perhaps, we're reminded of a story that is very important to us as a church family here, and that is in John chapter 4. You may have heard the story many, many times from this platform. Do you know what? I never get tired of this story. I never get tired of thinking about this Samaritan woman. And one, one morning she wakes up. On this morning, she doesn't know yet, her life is about to be transformed. But on that morning, it was just a normal morning. 
and she wakes up and the women of the village, before it gets too hot, the, the women wake up and because they're friends together, because they're tight, they, they go to the well before it gets too hot. You know, it's heavy work. If you've been in the, the two-thirds world, if you've been and seen women carrying water vessels, you know it's hard work. So you want to get that done so you've got fresh water for the day for your family. Well, that morning, a whole bunch of women, perhaps, typically, would have gotten up and gone to the well before it was too hot. But not, they didn't ask her. In fact, she ends up going in the heat of the day. She has no one to go with. She carries to the well, not just a bucket, but she carries her shame. Because we find out later on in this story in John chapter 4, she's carrying a lot of shame. She's got a reputation. In fact, she's been married multiple times. Now, that means that, that could be one of two things. It could be that, those were, that she's been divorced and remarried, divorced and remarried because of her own choices. It's most likely be she's been abused and neglected and that men have married her and then rejected her. And then another man marries and rejected. Even the person she's with now is not her husband. She's been kicked around. And you know what happens with sexual intimacy? There's a connection. Then if it's torn apart, it's like sellotape. The next time it doesn't stick as well. The next time there's brokenness, there's shame. And so she brings the bucket to the well. But actually we find out she's bringing all of her shame and all the regrets, and she's so alone. And then she meets Jesus. Now, Jesus shouldn't really be talking to her. He's the wrong gender and from the wrong tribe. And Jesus talks to her, and this story is just so profound. He starts talking about the water in the well and Jacob's well, all this in the context. There's a brilliant conversation after the few verses we're going to look at that, it, that is about the the, um, the essence of true worship and how Jesus kind of changes those categories. But listen to these words from the mouth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, from John chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus says, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well's very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Hallelujah. Then in verse 15, she goes, please, sir, give me this water. <laughs> Jesus is talking about the same well Jeremiah was talking about hundreds of years before. And that is the well of God, the well of the Holy Spirit who is available to all those that would turn to him. And here is, again, the Lord saying, hello, I'm over here. You can drink from a well of human making if you want to, but hello, I'm here. If you would only drink of me, says Jesus, then actually something profound will happen. Then a stream of living water will flow from you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And you might say, well, I know that. I mean, no, think about this. He's talking about to this Samaritan woman about a cleansing stream that can open up in her and then go through her into the lives of all those broken, dry, thirsty people around her. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And this is the wellspring. The wellspring is the Holy Spirit in and through, up and through and in and out, and up and through and in and out. Eternal, never-ending, bubbling spring. Hallelujah. This is what is offered to us if we would just turn from our systems and turn back to the Lord. And I know you might be thinking, well, Tim, I heard you preach on this many times. Do you know what? I've heard me preach this more times than you have because I've been here every time. <laughs> and I never get tired of this image because we live in a dry and thirsty land and we are a dry and a thirsty people. We're surrounded by a dry and thirsty society that is digging cisterns and sucking water from the dirt, and that water is killing us. I'm talking spiritually. 
And still today, the Lord says, hello, if you turn to me, a stream of living water will open up within you. Hallelujah. And look what happens. This, this woman, she knows God. By the end of this conversation, by the end of this episode, she knows God. She recognizes him as Messiah. Then she's known because the conversation is about her shame, about her sin. Wow, he, he's God and he knows me, but he doesn't judge her. In fact, he reveals secrets to her that people up until then had not even heard about the nature of true worship. He loves her. He doesn't push her away. Then she has a sense of purpose because she becomes one of the first evangelists because she now goes back to her village. You know the story. If you, read the, if, you had, if you don't know the story, read the rest of it. It's awesome. She goes back as the shame one. You know, the one, oh, that's her. She goes back and tells them, look, Guess what? I know everyone knows how broken I am. Guess what? I met a man who told me everything that's happened to me. You've got to meet him. And she's saying it with a smile on her face. She's saying it because she's forgiven. She's saying it because she's restored. Because actually the first bubble of living water has now come through and she's tasting the work of the Holy Spirit because now she realizes, do you know, it doesn't matter. He knows me and he loves me. And a community is transformed because you'll see later on uh, towards the uh, middle of chapter four, you'll see it says many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. In fact, the community is transformed. You see, that is our vision as a church family. That's our vision as a leadership team. That's our vision. Hopefully it's shared by everyone here. If it's not, I invite you to be part of it. Our vision is to see Jesus' love transform communities. To see that love, that forgiving love, that life-giving, non-religious, completely free, totally free by his grace. He knows us completely and he loves us all the same. To that love transforms communities. Maybe one neighborhood at a time, maybe one work team at a time, maybe one classroom at a time, maybe one conversation at a time, but this love of Jesus transforms communities. The whole village is never the same again. In fact, she's restored to the people around her. Those that said that they believe, they said in verse 42 of chapter 4, then they said to the woman, now we believe. Not just because what you told us, but because we've heard for ourselves. They receive the gift of God's grace and love. Now, who's the favorite person in the community? She is. Wow. Now she's belonging to people who are restored. I believe this is God's heart. It always has been, and it always will be, to see his love transform communities. Not just on Sundays, but on Mondays and Wednesday afternoons, when the kids are keeping you up at late at night and you wonder why you had them when no one ever wonders why they had them. Don't, don't get me wrong. When <laughs> no one ever wonders. <laughs> Just make that really clear. Never had that thought in my mind, no. Um, when the pressure's on at work, when... You just don't know whether you can get up in the morning. In those moments, you know, his love still wants to transform your community. He still wants to do something through you. You see, it, we do have a vision that is not about a bigger church numerically. It's not about the number of people in, uh, on a seat on a Sunday. It's actually about a better society. It's about better schooling. It's actually about the schools in this area being the best they can be. It's actually about shaping uh, civic policy. There's a, there's a group of people within this church family that, uh, um, that are helping form some legislation in our local council, putting, putting, passing motions through the council offices. There's, there's incredible things happening. There's conversations about how can we help uh, mental health across the community. You know, there's, God's love is transforming communities, not just here, but in places like Lebanon and Burkina Faso and Ethiopia, people that you'll never meet, people that I'll never meet. God, the love of Jesus is doing stuff already. But it's nothing compares to what he wants to do. It's nothing compares to what he wants to do. What he wants to do 
is actually about who you become. Not just who I become, but who you become. God's desire is that you become so full of him that you become, there's three things, it's really easy, become strong in faith. So trusting in God that when he asks you to do the impossible, the answer is yes. <laughs> strong in faith. To become deep in prayer. Where the place of prayer is not someone you, somewhere you run from or get too busy for, but a place that you run to, that you can't live without. And that we might become a people that are deep in prayer that we can move mountains, that we become a church that are bold in witness. Because of those things, you see, there's no question about whether the woman at the well, having been transformed, whether or not she's bold in her witness. She goes and tells people that used to call her all sorts of horrible things. Guess what? I met Jesus, the one who, you know that stuff you gossip about? When I go to the well on my own, he knows. (laughs) And he still loves me. She's bold in witness. Now, we are called to become. It's not just about our activity. It's about who we're becoming. That's the vision. And it is about you. It's not just about what we do together, but it's about the shared purpose that we have. Now, I wonder if I can do a straw poll here just quickly. I wonder if you think about the meaningful conversations that you have Uh, in a given day, or maybe the people that are watching your life. Let me just get a show of hands. If you have a meaningful interaction, and you can define that according to someone hears what you've got to say, you email them, or uh, you interact with them. If you work in a shop, there's a number of people that come into the shop. Uh, Hands up if you uh, have a meaningful interaction with more than 25 people in the average weekday. Okay, put your hands up. If it's more than 25 people that you have some kind of interaction with, okay, is is there anyone that has more than that? Any teachers here? Any people that it's more like 100? There's a few people that have interaction with more than 100. Anyone send the emails to thousands of people and that you word the emails? Yes, some of you are like, that's you. You're the one sending me the spam. (laughs) (laughs) Unsubscribe. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) Actually, if we deep dived into this, it's not very empirical research, but if we deep dive into this, I reckon probably the surface area of the people just in this room is that every single day we probably have interaction between three or... I I did a quick calculation, three to maybe 10,000 different people every day. That's just in this room. Imagine the surface area of all of us in our workplaces and schools and neighborhoods and shops and factories and classrooms and assembly rooms. Imagine how many people are watching us. William J. Tom said this, be careful how you live. You may be the only Bible some person ever reads. You may be, until they meet him himself, you may be the only, as uh, Dave was saying brilliantly, the only little Christ that someone ever meets. Back to Jeremiah, we're in thirsty land, we're amongst the thirsty people, and here's the call. What's what's the response in a dry place? It is so dry, isn't it? You might even recognize that in yourself. You think, do you know what? I see other people in the room, and I see them really praising, and and just glad, do you know what? I'm just not feeling it. I just feel so dry, Tim. If we had to one-to-one, and you're being really honest, you might say, Tim, do you know what? I'm dry as a bone. I feel like this COVID thing has just drained me dry. I, I sat in that lounge for day after day after day and no one called me. And here you are, Tim, you're talking about belonging, talking about being part of a people. Well, I, I didn't feel part of a people. No one reached out to me. If, if that's you, I, I hear your pain. I do. I recognize it. Or maybe you just get to a point where you feel like you've heard it all before and you might have heard me say it all before, like I said, that this is our response to return to the well. This is the only response I know. For us together to return to the well, that we might become the wellspring. Do you hear what I'm saying? The, the building, to become the extension before the extension's built. 
to become the extra capacity where people gather around the well of the Holy Spirit and are filled with the Holy Spirit. Our, our desire is to rediscover that. And in that, rediscover the beauty of the church. Even to rediscover the beauty of this local church. Because we've all been through this stuff, right? And maybe if you're new in this journey, you think, what do you mean the beauty of this local church? Look, look at everyone. Look, if you look around the room, look how handsome and beautiful everyone is. No, I mean the diversity. I mean the, the depth. I mean the, the wonder of so many people from different places having a common purpose of pursuing God together. I want to ask you a question in a moment. I wonder, I wonder if belonging is more of a choice before it becomes a feeling. What if belonging is more of a choice then it actually is a feeling. A bit like love. This belong journey we're going to, we're building up to today and the next week. Um, and uh, I want to give my apologies for this next Sunday because our Hannah is going off to university next Sunday. And so we're going to be driving up the motorway. But you're going to be hearing from David about the, the values. What would it mean actually to, to really be part of this local church family. And he's going to uh, share some more thoughts on that. But I just want to give you an idea of what this is an invitation to. And then we're going to pray together. The first thing this is an invitation to is to uh, belong to people that are pursuing God's presence. But will you recommit or commit for the first time to be part of a people that pursue God's presence? Blessed are those, Jesus said, who, are, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, yes? He also said, blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. Do you want to be part of a people that will pursue God's presence? Number one. That's number one. That's, that has to be number one before we do anything else. Will you be part of a people? And that means actively pursuing. That means going for it. It means going deep. Secondly, to make peace. In this place. Do you know, we live in a generation of wanderers. They could live anywhere, right? Oh, I could live anywhere. I could, I could work in New York in the same day as I work in Malaysia, and I could work in Watford. It doesn't matter. I could be anywhere. It doesn't matter. The internet has made us into like a global village, but I don't think that's God's heart. I really believe God's heart is in placing people. As in, here you are, you have finite resources except for me. You, have, you can only be in one place. You're not quite omnipotent yet. So, so there you are, I'm placing you there. That's God. Lord, you're Lord, 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 Lord. Yeah, yeah, he's Lord. That means, do we trust him to place us in a place? Well, what we do in that place really matters. Some of you think, well, I thought I came here for work. Guess what? Some of you came here for work, but you know what? God brought you here for work because it's a ministry he wants you to be part of. Maybe you might, what am I doing in Watford or wherever it is that you live? Do you know what? The Lord knows what you're doing because he placed you there. Can I hear an amen? amen. Uh, a friend of ours, Daniel Grothy, is a pastor in Colorado Springs, and he's written a book. It's not yet published um, but I've had a chance to read it already, and it's awesome. It's called The Power of Place, and it reflects on the Benedictine vow of stability and place. And he says, that, that, isn't it interesting how we all know that, Saint, uh, that um, Mother Teresa was from, where was she from? That's right, to Teresa of Calcutta. Most people know anything about her know that she was in Calcutta. She wasn't a disembodied kind of spirit. She was in a place. She changed lives in a place. So rise, Magdi of Bushy. Yes? yes. Nikki of Watford. What if that is entirely God's purpose? Do you know what? I'm going to place you there, you there, you there, you there. Like the, the best gardener. He's a better farmer than Jeremy Clarkson. He knows where to plant the right thing in the right place for his purposes. Will we yield to that? And say, I don't know why I'm here, but God, I'm here. Great, good start. It's an invitation, though, to, to, to work for peace, for shalom in that place. And some of you are thinking and looking for a better place or somewhere else. I pray that God would lead you. And, and the part of this journey is between now and the 26th of September, we're all going to do a lot of praying and thinking. 
And many of us, not all I don't think, but many of us are going to say, do you know what? I recognize God has placed me here. And we're not perfect, but, but this is where God's placed me. And we're going to give you a chance in a fun way with the thing out in the corridor to um, make that a prophetic statement. Quickly, thirdly, this is an invitation to refresh one another. To give a glass to the thirsty. If feel full of God, feel full of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? Not everyone next to you is or does. It's an invitation to refresh. Here, come and try this. This water is really good. The, the fecal coliform count is really low. This is pure water. This is good for you. This will give life to you. Come on, have a drink. Have a drink again. Fourthly, to share purpose. Do you know, um, I, I absolutely loved the Euros, right the way to the end, actually, even the pain of the very end. For any England fans, you know the pain I'm talking about. But I, I noticed that at the end of the semi-final that we won, um, the number of people from the England camp that ran onto the field. I mean, how many people finished the match? 11 on the pitch? How many people ran on? 40? 50? And we all know the name of Harry Kane. Or well, we should do. <laughs> Anyone know who Harry Kane is? I think we're okay. Do we know the name of Pat Frost? Pat Frost is the senior kit manager for the England team. Pat Frost runs onto the pitch and Harry Kane doesn't go, what are you doing here? Pat, Pat, Harry Kane gives him the hug of his life. Pat, thank you so much. Yay, we won, we won. On the same team. No one knows Pat Frost's name, I told you now. But actually, he was on the same team, part of the same purpose. And the players know that unless their kit's in shape, they can't score the goals. Yes, that's, that's what it means to have a shared purpose. I'm telling you, if you feel that you've lost that or never had that, this is an invitation to rediscover a shared purpose. And it might not be about your, your CV. It might not be about what people think of you. It might just be that you're part of a church family that is seeing Jesus' love transform communities. And that could be enough, couldn't it? And then in the, in the end, when there's that great day and the final whistle is blown, we'll all run onto the pitch and celebrate the victory that Jesus has won for this church family. Hallelujah. So let me just uh, recap this then. Uh, these four things. This is an invitation to inconvenience. There is nothing convenient about pursuing the presence of God. This is an invitation. I hope I'm selling this well. It's an invitation to agony because other people are really hard to get on with. People in Wellspring Church, really hard to get on with. You're meant to love them and actually you try to like them, but it's not always easy. And there's disappointment and there's broken promises and there's letting each other down. There's making mistakes and making bad decisions. And it's getting through the stuff of life and saying the wrong thing. It's agony, this thing. That's what this is. That's an invitation. That's how you make peace in a place, is you actually embrace the injustice. You care about the injustice. And then justice comes. It's an invitation to sacrifice. What I mean by that is that we are called by Paul in Romans 12 to live our lives as living sacrifice, to give our lives as living sacrifice. That means it's like all the stuff I've got, all the stuff I value, I lay it before you, Lord. And I say, well, whatever you want, then I'll work in this place. I'll refresh someone else. Often that means having, having less ourselves for the sake of the other. I hope you're excited about it. It's a great journey. So what have we got? Inconvenience, agony, sacrifice, then the C word, commitment. Not very popular. Word, commitment. What, you mean commit to a local church? No one does that these days. Someone said, why are you trying to do this? I'm not trying to do anything. We're trying to be honest with what we feel God's saying. The Lord is saying, regather at the well. And you need to know who's gathering with you as well. So no one gets left behind so you can actually pastor. So David and his pastoral leadership team know actually who they're pastoring. Would be good, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be good? 
So actually call the people to commitment. And some will go, well, you're asking way too much. When David lays this out next week, some of you are going to hear that. Go, that's, that is so 1980s. <laughs> that, that's really, that's back in the last millennium. <laughs> that's when David was born, that's right. <laughs> so uh, that's so, such an 80s boy. <laughs> oh, no one does that anymore. What, commit to a local church? You must be kidding. No one does that anymore. They watch what they want. They pick and choose. They watch the service they want. Nothing, nothing gets those watching on the... But, but this is an invitation for you as well, honestly. <laughs> honestly, it's an invitation for you as well. It is. Oh, do you know, I think I've got the message that Tim's saying, so do you know what? I'm going to go and listen to Stephen Furtick instead. Listen, if it's that easy a choice, just listen to Stephen Furtick. He's an awesome preacher. Really. It's an invitation, actually to make a commitment and say, this is my church family, warts and all. I believe God will hear that. And it's not a covenant, okay? It's not marriage. Hello? It's not marriage. That's a covenant. But a commitment before God can go a long way to make a big difference. So maybe we can answer this question, what if it's a choice before it's a feeling? And... It's up to you, between you and the Lord over these couple of weeks. You might want to pray and ask God. And for some of you, it's like, well, it's an easy question to answer. I know, this is where God's planted me. For others, this is going to help you. Because on the 26th, when we gather in celebration, we're going to, listen, wear as colourful dresses as you can. Uh, we're going to have fantastic food. We're going to get some marquees out the side over there, and, and there's going to be room for everyone, even if it's raining. Does that sound good? We have a big, big party in the presence of the Lord. And before we pray, and I want to read from Isaiah as we do so, I just want to say one other thing. You might be thinking, oh, Tim, this is all very one way. I'd love to continue the conversation. Well, we can do that over tea and coffee, if you like. You can do that. But we've also recorded a podcast. And this afternoon at 2 o'clock, it drops. See, I'm so with it, aren't I? Yeah, the podcast it drops at 2. Yeah. Um, there's a podcast that sounds um, the um, Rachel Barula and uh, Rachel and Michael Penrose and Olu Amasan. We got in a room together to talk about some of the stuff that you've just heard. To talk about what, why does it hurt the way it does? What does it actually mean? Uh, you'll be really blessed by listening to that 30 minutes or so. So maybe at some point this week on your way to work or while you're doing the ironing uh, or whatever, you might want to listen to the Belong podcast and we hope that's going to help you. So uh, God bless you in that. Now, I wonder if we could now become again even more aware of the presence of the Lord. And put your Bibles down. If you're at home, then just uh, put the other screens away. And we're going to spend some time in God's presence. And as we do so, I want to read to you from the heart of God, from Isaiah chapter 35. I'm going to read this over you. And I want you in this to think about the dry places in your world, in your workplace, in your neighborhood. Think about where there's dryness, maybe even in your own soul. And then hear words that were written a couple hundred years before Jesus was resurrected from the dead and then poured out his Holy Spirit on the early church. Listen to this. Yeah, listen to this. Isaiah 35. You might want to close your eyes. Try and picture these things. Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He's coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. 
Springs will gush forth in the wilderness and streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool and springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. And a great road will go through the once deserted land. It will be named the highway of holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will, only be, it will be only for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any ferocious beasts. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear and they will be filled with joy and gladness. Holy Spirit, we are thirsty for more of you. And we pray, God, that in our wastelands, the water will run freely again. In our dry places, Lord, may we know your presence washing all the shame, bringing forgiveness and restoration and healing and life. Where there's death, let there be life. Life in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's continue our response. Shania and the band are going to sing a song kind of over us. You can join in if you want, but just let it wash over you. Make this the prayer of your heart. Your presence is heaven.
Let's obey your thirst. Obey your thirst. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. It's okay. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. Just the offer of more and more and more. We say, come Holy Spirit. We want more of you. More of you. We're thirsty for you. we want to say together as a church family, God, we want more of you. We don't want just organization. We don't want to run a charity. We don't want to run services or do all that stuff, Lord, as much as we just want you, Lord. Just want you. And we want you, Lord, to be the center of every thought. And Lord, we come to you with confession on our lips and we say, we're sorry, Lord. We are sorry. We're sorry. I'm sorry, Lord, for any cisterns I've been drinking from. When all the time you're there, all the things that are kind of easier, more convenient, that are more about us, Lord. I pray that you'd yeah, just we, we turn our back on those cisterns and we turn back to you, God. I just want to say as we're praying, if you haven't done that ever in your life, if you've never turned to the Lord, and if this is you, you know what I'm talking about. If you've had a shoulder to him or you've had your back towards him, in this moment, I, I just plead with you. I invite you to turn to the Lord and say, okay, Jesus, here I am. And as we sing this song, to make this the song, the words go, Jesus, be the center. Jesus, be the center. If that's you for the first time, know that he hears the songs of your heart. And if at home you're in that position, I encourage you where you are, make this Make this song your prayer. So come, Holy Spirit. Let's pray in song. <laughs>